say at this point hello and uh, thank you for tuning in as you some of you may recognize me from a long time ago when I did a few videos and now we're on a, a great channel RTN and uh, which my good friend of mine started up and I'm pleased and delighted to be on RTN I think it has a great future in bringing a balanced approach to uh, biblical preaching and teaching. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity of being on an RTN at this particular time. I find this really difficult. And the reason I find it difficult is because I used to stand on platforms and preach and teach to people and I find that easier than simply looking at a camera and endeavouring to speak to a camera because there's no response back and you don't see any smiling faces and also you don't f see any people, which is the benefit side of people falling asleep when you're teaching and preaching. But thank you for tuning in. That is both of you. I appreciate that very much indeed. Now, what am I about today? What is the object of this exercise? Well, first of all, what I want to try and do is this. I want to try and encourage you to begin to learn things from the Bible for yourself. And I'll deal with that as we come into our subject. I may repeat myself in some phrases and some illustrations more than once, but that is simply because repetition is the foundation of really good teaching so that thoughts and expressions and illustrations can be indelibly imprinted on people's minds. So that's basically what I'm endeavouring to do to encourage you and to help you to uh, get stuck into your Bibles for yourself. Now, I'm not implying that you don't, but we all need helps. And that's basically what I'm endeavouring to do today, is simply to be a help. So let's start by saying this. 
our world is changing rapidly. In fact, it's incredible how fast the world has changed since I was born in 1940. The world has changed out of all recognition with uh, progress in so many things. So many things are not progress, but other things in technology and communications. It just blows your mind what they have achieved in the last <coughs> 80 odd years. But there you go, the world has changed rapidly. But what has changed rapidly and more disconcerting in recent years, the last couple of decades, very rapidly and getting more faster as it goes on, the change, and that is change in church life. You're getting pressures without, because Christian Christianity, and biblical Christianity, is being marginalized. We can all feel that in so many different ways. But that said, there is also pressure within the church, and we'll deal with that as we come to some things in our sharing together today. Now, I don't know what your church life is like. You may be in a good, solid, sound, biblical church, and that is great. I envy you. That's great. That is not my position at this present time, unfortunately. But that's great if you're there, and I encourage you to stick in and keep going. Others may not be in such a good situation, or you may, as some may be, in a house church. Others, like myself at this present time, well, myself and my wife, are on our own because of certain situations, and one of them, not the least, of physical uh, handicap at this particular time in our lives, and we may be on our own. Now, in these days of fast-changing circumstances, I believe it is essential to feed yourself, spiritually, of course, speaking, on the Word of God. Now, I would like to share with you some simple studies, and I'm emphasizing the word simple studies. Let me put it this way. Uh, I once heard, and I can't remember where it was, of a manager of a team who wasn't doing very well. And of course, people were coming up with all sorts of suggestions. Well, we need to spend money, buy some new players, top-notch players. And the manager shook his head. Well, we need to get a new training program and the manager just listened to all the different suggestions that were coming up. I says, no, what we need to do is get back to basics. We're going to start training the team now on the basic fundamentals of how to do this, that, and the next thing, back to basics. And you know something, it worked. And I've found in my own experience that periodically over the years and when I've been in ministry, I've deliberately gone back to basics for my own personal benefit so that you can get the fundamentals right so that uh, getting back to basics can have great benefits. So when we're getting back to basics, I want to do some word studies and to share with you some biblical tools and helps so that you can study for yourself. And what you study for yourself sticks with you the longest. So we will have a word study today. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to share the Roman road with you as a tool of outreach for the gospel and as an effective tool of evangelism. And then I would like to bring another simple little study to you on the theme of Jesus, my Saviour. And it is imperative that we understand with all of the deception and with all of the cults that are now 
taking advantage of the technology that we all use to bring their form of who they think Jesus is. We need to get back to basics and know that Jesus is our Saviour. So we'll start off with a word study. <coughs> so again, thank you for tuning in. Our investigation into the meaning of words in our Bibles. That is our object of today's little study. A minister of yesteryear said this, The more I study words, the more I am convinced of their basic and their fundamental importance. On the meaning of words, everything depends. Now we live in a time of many voices telling us of their own visions of reality, all proclaiming their own vision of truth, of values, and of course, life's meaning. In the church, we have a lot of what is called now the feel-good factor of preaching, and many nonsensical things are spoken out, which leads often to crazy antics displayed from platforms. Let me quote this to you. It may not be the full quotation, but I read this quotation uh, a little while ago, but it's near enough, the exact quotation that I read. And the quotation is this. It is only in Scripture that we can find truth. And as we live out the truth, then God's word speaks to transform our perspective of reality and to reshape our attitudes and values. The end of the quote. So I agree with that. It is only in Scripture that we can find an unclouded vision of God's reality for our lives. So, where do we go from here? Well, we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And the words recorded there is this. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman that does not need to be uh, ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So we will look at two words here and we'll just do it simply. First, the word diligent, which is found in the New American Standard Translation. The same word in the authorised version, and I believe in the New King James, is the word study. So you have in the New American Standard, be diligent to present yourself, and in the authorised, the New King James, study to approve yourself. Arnott and Gingrich, two competent, very competent Greek scholars, uh, define the word this way. Be zealous or eager. Take pains to make every effort. So diligent is a good translation. And then the second word is this. Accurately handling the word, which is the New American Standard way. The authorised version puts it this way. Rightly dividing. Rightly dividing. Now to many people, that phrase, rightly dividing, so they get their Bibles, rightly dividing, this is for this time and for this people, this is for this time and this people, and this is for a future time and for a future, rightly dividing. Now there is a measure of truth there. But what they do is this, when they concentrate that rightly dividing exclusively to everything else. And that is the key to their understanding of the Bible. And so they go down a dead-end street 
of extreme, and I want to emphasize the word extreme dispensationalism, which holds, for instance, that the Sermon on the Mount uh, does not apply to us today, uh, but is to the millennium. The millennium, of course, as we all know, if you've read your Bibles, the thousand-year reign of Christ upon this earth. So, if you go down that dead-end street, we are robbed of some of the most important teaching of Jesus for our daily living. The Greek word means to cut a straight line. Hebrews 12, 13 tells us, Make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And what we've got to understand here is this, is that we have to choose the straight way. And when we choose the straight way, then we have to be obedient to what the Word says there. We have to have that resolve. And some of us have to have a renewal in our resolution to come back to the basics of God's Word. The Revised Version of 1881 in the uh, uh, 1881 for the New Testament and 1885 for the Old Testament, the Revised Version in the margin of this text said this, holding a straight course in the Word of Truth. I like the marginal reading. Holding a straight course in the Word of Truth. And that will lead to what? That will lead to spiritual health, healing the wound or the limb that limps so that can be healed. No deteriorating down devious or crooked ways or going recklessly down side roads, but to hold a straight course in the middle of the road. Well, you may say to me, <coughs> okay, I've heard what you've said. How do we do that? Simply by sane and sensible interpretation of Scripture. If the plain meaning, and this is an old saying, but it still holds true, if the plain meaning makes sense, then don't seek any other meaning. Don't get some fanciful ideas or going into the realm of, well, I'll spiritualize this to a ridiculous extent. If the plain meaning makes sense, then don't seek any other sense. This is where the word studies in knowing what the word that we're reading or studying means. Seeing the truth in these words that we're endeavoring to study, truly hand hearing what God is saying, and God wants us to know in the study of a particular word. Now, in the study of a particular word, this is where the cults major on. They take a word, they then take it out of context, and they shove it for your, to your mind, through the, your ear gate, and then they'll jump to another word and take it out of context and another text and another portion of scripture. Now, when you're doing word studies, you've got to keep the word that you're studying, and we need to remember this, we need to keep the word that we are studying in the context which the word that we are studying gets its meaning. Because you can take a word in one context and it will be translated one way to bring out the meaning within that context and that context of truth that God wants us to hear. Then we can go to another scripture where the Greek, same Greek word is used there, but it will be translated slightly differently to bring out the fuller meaning within the context of the truth that's being conveyed to us there. So we have to study the words within the context to get the right meaning, but that doesn't take away us studying individual words. 
and the result will be being built up in our most holy faith. Now let me say this to you, for I've learned this the hard way, and please believe me, I've paid for my learning. Now, I have sat under the teaching of God-appointed teachers and preachers, and I have benefited very much from their teaching, and I still do. I still listen to God-appointed preachers and teachers, and I receive tremendous benefit from their teaching. So I encourage you, if you find a good, sane, sensible uh, expos uh, expository of God's Word, giving a good expository teaching, then stick with them. Benefit from their uh, studies and from the gift of God that is within them. I benefited and I still do benefit from sitting under such people. But, and it's a good but, but the things that we learn for yourself stick with you the longest. Second Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. Well, that will stick with you the longest. Now that was the short preface of what I tried to say. So let's come to our first word study. And what's the first word that we're going to study? Going with the theme, back to basics, gospel. The gospel. The word gospel. <laughs> Which can lead us to other word studies. So you start with the word gospel, and then suddenly you find there are avenues of truth in other words attached to the word gospel, such as regeneration, conversion, justification, sanctification, adoption. And if we are uh, to see these things they are all associated with the good news from God that he brings regeneration, conversion, justification, sanctification and being adopted as sons into his family by the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. All attached to that word gospel as we can explore these different avenues that come from this one word. Gospel is basically an Anglo-Saxon word, God spell, which is literally translated God story. And what a story it is <laughs> indeed. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, what a story it is. We see the good news, the gospel, again and again and again in God's story. Genesis 3.15, I'd like to bring your attention to that. And it says this, After the fall of man, that is Adam and Eve, his wife, after Eve yielded to the temptation of Satan, and the woman was tempted first, and I hope I'm not getting myself into trouble and losing half my... Uh, congregation, so to speak, there, but I'll clarify that as I go on. God says this to the old serpent in Genesis, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Satan uses the woman to bring man down. Whoops, don't jump on your high horses, ladies. Please stick with me. I'll get the balance, just bear with me. Satan uses the woman to bring man down. Eve was deceived first. God uses the same woman, the same vessel, a woman, to lift man up. And we'll come to that. 
and says, bruise thy head. Out of the head of the serpent comes a poisonous venom. The scripture says this, we are not ignorant of his devices. This is why God bruises a certain serpent's head, spiritually speaking. We are not ignorant of his devices. Satan, the enemy of your soul, the enemy of my soul, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, year in, year out, is conjuring up in his mischievous mind evil devices to trap, to cause you to stumble, to bring temptation. How is the best way I can tackle this person with temptation? How can I get their ear in temptation? How can I trip this one up? How can I make this one stumble? How can I make this one fall short? His mind's going all the time, bringing evil devices. But because we study God's word, we are not ignorant of his devices. But also venomous, poisonous, venomous venom. Speaking, as the natives American Indians used to say in all the Westerns, white man speaks with a forked tongue. The old serpent indeed does that. So he comes to Eve. And Eve is telling him, well, we could eat of any tree in the garden, any tree that we like, but we have not eat of this one. So he comes and says, hmm, indeed, indeed. Has God said that? Did God actually say that to you, Eve? Did God really say that? Eve, let's throw some arbitrary light on the subject. And what is the temptation? The temptation is this, to introduce to Eve to begin with and to the rest of us, to introduce human interpretation into what God has said. Just a subtle slant on it. And this particular dangerous and temptation is very prevalent in the church today and unfortunately it will increase. The serpent's threefold subtlety, A, he cast doubt on God's word, B, he, de he denies God's truth and C, he defames God's character and you can find that in Genesis chapter 3 cast doubt on God's word in verse 1, deny God's truth in verse 4, and defame God's character in verse 5. In Genesis 3.15, we have the first messianic promise. Her seed from the vessel of the woman, Christ of God, came into this world to bruise, to crush the serpent's head, that's good news. That's the gospel. As Satan used the channel of the woman to tempt her and then for her to influence her husband, Adam, Eve, and he fell. So God turns around and uses the same channel to lift mankind up and bring the Savior into the world. First John 3, 8 says this. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil, the old serpent. We also see the gospel truth typified in Israel's sacrificial system. For your further study, I won't go into all the details, neither will I go into all the scriptures, but I will give them to you so that you can study them for yourself and your study, of course, will benefit, your personal study will benefit for you. So for your further study, 
in the sacrificial system where the gospel is typified, we go to Leviticus chapter 16 and verse and chapter 17. And then you can go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through to verse 10. And then you can go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through to verse 10. And then you can go to verse 14. And in that, the Spirit of Truth will help you to learn for yourself. We see in Isaiah chapter 40 through to chapter 60, the gospel, the good news. The good news, the gospel of the blessings in the coming messianic times. But in particular, we see the good news of the Saviour, his sufferings and what he went through for on our behalf, particularly in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, in verse 1, we see him as the sinless Saviour, the arm of the Lord. In verse 7, he is the silent sufferer. He opened not his mouth. In verse 10, he is a stupendous sacrifice, an offering for sin. In verse 11, he is a satisfactory settlement, justifies many. And there are many other things that we could bring out from uh, that chapter in Isaiah, chapter 53, a marvellous and wonderful chapter, speaking of Christ and his sufferings on your behalf and my behalf at Calvary's cross. So we can bring out many things, but we will simply touch on things very, very lightly. The gospel is this. God saw man's ruin and he had man's remedy ready. Jesus. That's good news. The Greek words, <coughs> excuse me, the Greek words that are relevant for the study of the gospel are this, evangelon. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. I know a little Greek. He's a tailor. I once had to take a pair of trousers to him. And he said to me, Euripides? I said this. He says, I mended these. I know a little Greek. But uh, I'm not a Greek scholar. But you get the gospel from Evangelon which brings the sense of joyful tidings, good news. And then you have evangelizo, to share the good news. We would simply say evangelize. So we are to receive and then we are to share. A question, what do we receive and what do we share? Now, it's God's intention that we become, sorry, I said that the wrong way. It is not God's intention, by no stretch of the imagination. It's not God's intention that we become spiritual reservoirs, just receiving, 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 and swelling up with much fullness and never giving up. A reservoir to be effective has got to take in, and it's designed to give out. We are designed to take in God's truth and we are commanded to give out God's truth. First, we've got to address the question, what do we receive? Well, Paul helps us here. And I want to read from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Romans chapter 1, verses 1. One, two, four. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who descended from David 
according to the flesh, or to be more literal, who was of the seed of David and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So what do we receive? That which I've just read to you. First, we see two things here. A, we see God's grace doctrinally stated. And then we see, B, the proof of Christ's identity. Now, we do not deal with, we will not deal with all that is here. There's so many truths that we could bring out. But we will just look at two truths simply. First, in verse 2, the Holy Scriptures. And second, in verses 3 and 4, the seed, the descendant, the seed of David, the Son of God. So we'll deal with the first one, the Holy Scriptures. First, the Holy Scriptures in Graphis Haggis. Now, the absence of the article there in N. Graphis Haggis throws a stress on Haggis, which means holy. So we see three things here. The books of the Bible, first of all, the books of the Bible are holy, for they contain the promises of God himself. B, the books of the Bible are holy as they convey God's revelations. And see, the books are holy, for they contain holy truth. When we go to Luke chapter 24, and uh, I won't jump to every scripture that I quote today, but I want to quote this one. In Luke chapter 24, and in verses 25 to 27, we have these words recorded there. And he said to them, um, where are we? Yeah. And he said to them, O foolish ones and so of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. All the scriptures. They flow through all the prophets, all the scriptures. Hagion, which belongs to God in his attribute of holiness, is this. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired of God, is by the inspiration of God, is breathed out by God. All scripture is God breathed. Why does it put it that way? God breathed. Coming from the heart and the mind of God, the scripture breathed out. It's breathed out because God wants it to go deeply into the hearts and minds of the writers. So that when it comes into the hearts and the minds of the writers, that God breathed, that God living word will flow from the channel of their ministry as we read their ministries in Holy Scripture will become alive and relevant into our hearts and into our minds. It's living. It's breathed out from the living God to the prophets and all the scriptures and then through their writings into our hearts and into our minds. Now the holiness of God, Hagion, the holiness of God is twofold. He's absolute in moral holiness and he's absolute in majestic holiness. In Leviticus, 
we see three kinds of fire. One, the fire of acceptance. And you can read that in Leviticus 9, verses 3 and 24. And it says, The fire came out from the Lord. So there was an offering presented, and the fire consumed the burnt offering. God accepted it. And the second is this, the fire of transgression. And you read about that in Leviticus 10 and in verse 1. And uh, Aaron's two sons, who were priests. Now, they were priests, so their position before God was right. But their condition in offering was wrong. They offer strange fire, as you read that scripture. The fire of transgression. And then the third thing is this. You have the fire of retribution. And you read about that in Leviticus 10 and verse 2. The fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Leviticus 10, 3. God's absolute moral holiness. For it says in verse 3, I must be regarded as holy. So there are two lessons there. A, any disobedience of God's command distracts from his glory. Any, any disobedience. And B, we can only approach God on his terms. An exercise, a study for yourself on what the strange fire was and then equate it to what we see today. That would be a good little exercise. Now we have God's majestic holiness. He is transcendent in his majestic holiness. God's transcendence means he is infinitely superior to his finite creation and is exalted above it relationally but not spatially. He is above creation in the sense that he is greater than the creation. He is independent of it. In Isaiah 57 and verse 15, we read these words. We see God's transcendence this way. For it says, For thus says the high and exalted one, that is God, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place. God's transcendence. Now, does that mean that God is unreachable? No, no, it doesn't. God is also immandent. God is not remote or isolated from creation. His attributes of omnipresence he is everywhere present. A mandate remaining in creation. Now this sounds a contradiction, doesn't it? He is a mandate for he dwells in the contrite and lowly of spirit. God is both transcendent and a mandate. Now these two aspects of God's being immanence and transcendence, shape the way in which he relates to creation and to his creatures, which is you and me. In Matthew 1 and 21, Emmanuel, that marvelous and wonderful word, Emmanuel, God with us. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Transcendence and immanent coming together. In Isaiah 57 and verse 15, we read there God as inhabiting both eternity and the hearts of those who have a contrite and humble spirit. Now that's good news. That's the gospel. Now, on a personal note, immanence gives us comfort and stability. And I'll just read this other scripture to you. 
found in Psalm 16 and in verse 8 of Psalm 16. Psalm 16 and in verse 8, it says this, and this is David speaking. I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I shall not be shaken. So we see that God's emandance gives us comfort and stability in Psalm 16 and verse 8. God discloses himself in Romans 1 verses 3 and 4 most fully in Jesus Christ, the seed of David, the son of God, the son of the woman in Genesis 3 15. The question, who is Jesus? And again, I will emphasize, we will touch on this very briefly and very simply. I want to encourage you to study this subject for yourself, and that is the subject of the Trinity, because the subject of the Trinity and the theology of the Trinity is greatly misunderstood and it is greatly abused by the cults and by people who just simply believe in a oneness, a utilitarian uh, presentation of God uh, from their reading of the scriptures. But I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I believe the Trinity. How can we condense that into a very simple phrase? The Trinity. One in essence, three in person. Jesus is the eternal second person of the triune Godhead who has two distinct natures, fully divine nature and fully human nature. The incarnation joined perfect humanity with full deity. Verse 11 says this, Excuse me while I adjust my glasses. He will save his people from their sins. Now, when you read Matthew 1, verses 18 to 21, you read there about the incarnation. And that is good news. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 32 and verse 35, you have the human and the divine. Mary shall bring forth a son. That is the human son. But he is also called the son of the highest. So you have the human and divine in that scripture. Mary shall bring forth a son, the human aspect of the incarnation. And he shall be called the son of the highest, the divine part of Christ. The son, Jesus, forever the God-man, and who is the object of believer's faith as the redeeming word made flesh in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. As we study a word, in this case the word gospel, you will find that your study will expand into further studies. Jesus as the Messiah, Savior of the house of David, we see Jesus as he exercises the offices of prophet and priest and king. People need a prophet to reveal God. The NIV puts John chapter 1 verse 18 this way. No one has ever seen God. Well, you can throw back at me and you can say, well, wait a minute, how come? In the Old Testament, some people saw God. Some people got little glimpses of God's glory. You see, our moral eyes simply could not behold God in the fullest manifestation, brightness of his glory. Moses had to be hidden in the cleft of the rock and see and look upon the receding part, back part of God's glory as he passed by. In John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, 
but the only, the one and only Son, who is Himself God, and He is the closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. We see God in Christ. John 6 and verse 46, No one has seen the Father except the one who is from the Father. Only He has seen the Father. John 14 and 9, Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how do you say, Philip, shows the Father? They, the disciples, saw Jesus in the flesh. We see Jesus, the living word, through the written word. And God has illuminated that word to our hearts and to our minds by his precious Holy Spirit. For when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will lead you, as you study for yourself, into all truth. The Word of God truly brings us good news of Jesus, who is the living Word of God for all of mankind. Yes, people need a prophet to reveal God. They need a priest to represent them before God. They need a king to rule over them in righteousness. Now, Melchizedek was a priest and a king. Samuel was a prophet and a priest. David was a prophet and a king. But only Jesus functions in each role at the same time forever. That's good news for you and for me. That's gospel. The gospel is the good news of God's love. Oh, how do we begin to describe God's love? How can we clearly help people to understand God's love? Now, I'm not the sharpest knife in the cutlery drawer. I admire people with greater intellect. So I need to bring illustrations and I need to understand things in a very simple way. So how do we see God's love? And it's very important that we do understand and see how much God loves us and the way that he loves us. That, that, that's vitally important to us. So the gospel is good news of God's love, of course, express, expressed to us in Jesus Christ. Here we are. Now, I want to just steady up for a little moment and uh, want to clarify a point. I mentioned God's love. How do we express God's love? Now, why I love to express that and to show you many, some illustrations about how God loves us and the way he loves us, but that is in the next thing that we will look at. It is not in this particular study. We will deal with how God loves us and how God demonstrates his love to us in our next little study, which is the Roman road, if you care to tune in and to see what that is. But Christ loved us and gave himself for us. God loved us, not that we loved him, but God loved us first. And we understand these things. So we come back on track and to what I was saying is this, is this, that what do we share? Well, what do we receive? We receive Christ as our personal saviour. And to answer the second question, as I come to an end of our little sharing together today, is this, what do we share? Now this will be short. And uh, as I said, we will then come to an end. And I'm going to share with you two stories from my own experience about what do we share, which will lead on to our uh, next study together and the study after that. So I'm going to share two stories with you. True stories, real stories, from my own experience, simply to illustrate what we are to share. 
I thought, a great while ago when Billy Graham made his last evangelistic tour of the country. He came to the northeast of England where I was pastoring a church, a city centre church in the city of Sunderland. And Billy Graham came to that city to do his uh, crusade there. And the Billy Graham organisation uh, took me and a couple of, and a few other ministers away to a retreat for uh, a good few days, the better part of a week, to teach us uh, how to teach other people to become good communicators of God's Word and to train them as counsellors, uh, as people would inquire at the end of the crusade after Billy Graham gave his appeal. I was in charge of the whole of South Tyneside in uh, teaching the counsellors for the crusade. It was a big job and we had a full house for all the time I was teaching. And there was reams and reams and reams of stuff to teach. I also had another job that I was responsible for a team of people who then, when all the decision cards were brought up, I was in charge of the team who would suss them out to where people lived and there would be many things that they would come and ask me questions for. Where do we send this one? How do we reply to that one? What church do we send them here? And it was quite two responsible jobs. And when the crusade was finished and people went away, uh, myself and many others who were trained by the Billy Graham organization would be there to 12 and 1 o'clock and later the following morning dealing with all the inquiries. But this is the illustration I want to leave with you. My wife and I had two friends in another church and they had a daughter. They had two or three daughters but they had this particular daughter who was going to be a counsellor. Now she was being trained in another church but she knew I was doing South Tyneside and she came to me she says, Charlie. I says, yeah, what? I can't take it in. I brain can't take it in. I, it won't go in. There's just too much stuff to remember. I says, I agree with you. <laughs> I really agree with you. I said, look, and between you and me, don't tell Billy Graham organization. I says, leave that stuff aside and I'll show you a simple way. I says, get your little Bible out and get your, or your New Testament and right in the front, Romans 3.23, Romans 6, 23, Romans 10, 9, Romans 5, 8, and Romans 5, 1. She says, that's it. I says, that's it. So she did that. I says, then mark it with a little underlined pencil in your Bible so you have it with you. A little tool. And I'm going to share that with you. Now, this is the first experience. It's an effective little tool and helping people understand what God has done. Romans 3, 23. Now, what you do is, and we will go further into this in our next study, but we'll go to Romans. This is the Roman road, but I'm not touching the Roman road fully today. So we go to Romans 3, 23. And what you do is this. You go to Romans 3, 23, and you read the scripture to someone. And it says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, you put a little thought there. And the little thought is this, We simply cannot attain to the standards of God's righteousness. For all have sinned. I say, simply share that with someone. They'll understand that. Then you go to Romans 6, 23. And there you have the bad news, and there you have the good news. And we'll read the bad news, and we'll read the good news. 
And it's this. Romans 3, uh, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. <laughs> That's bad news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good news. That's gospel. So you share the bad news and you share the good news. The bad news, people get up tight. The good news, oh, good. I don't have to go face death. And then you go to Romans 10 and 9. And you have to believe this with all the fiber of your being, just not simply with head knowledge. And Romans 10 and 9, which is a little phrase that you use, Romans 10 and 9 is a favorite verse of mine. It says this, For the, with the heart one believes and is justified. We will deal with justification at a later date. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So what do we have there? But you've got to believe that with all the fibre of your being and your heart and confess what Christ has done. Romans 10 and 9. And I read out Romans 10 and 10 there. So I told you I was silly, didn't I? So back to Romans 10 and 9. Romans 10 and 9. That Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Romans 10, 10 follows on for, with that. And with your heart, uh, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Please forgive me for that little hiccup there. I'll put it down to my age and the deterioration of my cognitive powers. I'm trying to provoke your sympathy. So in Romans 10 and 9, you've got to believe that with all the fibre of your being. And then you go to Romans 5, 8. So I'm teaching uh, our friend's daughter this, and she's beginning to grasp it and understand it. It helps her, and it's simple for her to understand and to deal with. Romans 5, 8 says this, But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for our benefit. He died in our place. He was our substitutionary sacrifice. And then you go to Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified, how? By faith. And what do we receive? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a feeling. Peace is not a feeling, but a standing. As we experience peace with God, we will experience the peace of God. Now, she understood that. A simple, direct, all-in-one book, help a little tool for evangelism and getting someone to understand the good news, the gospel. My second experience was this. I arrived at a church in uh, Sunderland, taking up the pastorate there. And I didn't really know anybody at that time. I was just very short. I don't think I was a full month or more in the church. And there had been a, a couple there who used to attend the church, but they had left years and years and years before. In fact, a couple of decades before, I, I believe it was, uh, through misunderstanding and through hot. We've got to deal with reality when we're dealing with the things of the church as well. And uh, they hadn't, they hadn't followed Christ, and they hadn't, they had, they hadn't attended church, and they had a son, and he. Their only son, he was their only child, and he was dying of cancer. 21 year old. And the fellow's brother was in the church, and he came to me and told me about the situation. 
And I simply said, well, if there's any way I can help, I'm willing to help. And I never heard anything for about a week or so. And then they invited me over to their son's house to see him. And I went over. He was in the last stages of that terrible disease of cancer. He was literally dying before my eyes. 21 year old. How do you share the gospel of God's salvation with some there? So I went up to his room. I'd never met the young man. His name was John. I never met John. I had nothing in common with him. What did I say? What did I do? And then I remembered, and in my mind came something that his parents had said, that there was a young man who kept himself fit. He'd worked out with weights. Now he's dying in front of me and he's very, very weak. And I said, hello, John. I hear you used to work out with weights. I said, I used to lift weights. And just for an extremely brief time, I said, did you? I said, yeah. And we said, oh, yeah, I bench pressed such and such a pound, did you? I uh, clean and snatch such and such a poundage. And we had a bridge. And he was growing weaker before my eyes. And I, we only talked for a minute, literally a minute, about weightlifting. And he knew he was, di he knew he was dying. I said, John, I want to share something with you from God's Word. I says, if you will, will allow me. He says, yes, I will. I said, it's found in the book of Romans, chapter 10 and verse 9. And it's this, John. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then I personalised it a little bit. I says, John, if John confesses with your mouth, John, that Jesus is Lord, do you believe Jesus is Lord? And he said, I do. And believe in your heart, John, that God raised him from the dead. Do you believe that? I says, yes, I do. I says, then what has God said? You will be saved. I says, yes. I'm trying to remember, it was a long, long, it was over 40 years ago, this. I can't remember if I had a brief word of prayer. I, I, I can't remember exactly. But he says, you'll have to excuse me now. I, I can't take any more. I'm very weak. I says, I understand. And I had to leave it there. One simple verse from the living, breathed out Word of God from the prophets and the teachers of the Old Testament writings breathed out God's Word through His Word into John's heart and into John's mind. I never saw him again. I took his funeral service, but I never saw him again this side of eternity. But his mother and father told me when they went to visit him in the hospital a few days later, in his last stages, she says, 
You know, our John is telling the doctors and the nurses, he says, you know, I'm saved. I choked up. The God breathed word through the scriptures had been breathed into John's heart and mind. I took his funeral service. Our church had the seating of about 500, for 500 people. It was packed. Many of him, of his friends and workmates and representatives from the council, because he worked from the council, and from church people that, that were there as well, it shows you the type of young man he was. I'm trying to give you tools, helps for evangelism to help people to come to Christ. In Psalm 139, we read that God knows all about us. He knows everything about us. He knows our uprising, our downsetting, our going out and our coming in. He knows our thoughts are far off. We understand that. May I ask you a question? A question that the Lord asked Adam. Adam, where art thou? Where art thou? in your relationship with God? Where art thou in your study of God's Word? Where art thou in the work of evangelism and sharing God's Word? Where art thou? The Gospel was conceived in the heart of God. The Gospel was planned in the mind of God. The Gospel was delivered by the Son of God. <coughs> Psalm 119 and verse 17 How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Your personal salvation wrought for you on Calvary's cross by God's beloved Son. This should prove to you, this should show to you, and it shows to me, that you were always on his mind. For Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. People hear the gospel in two ways. Some hear it only with their ears, and they don't respond to the gospel. Others hear it deep within them, and they respond to the gospel. How do you hear this, what I've tried to share with you today? Whether you're a believer, or someone who's grown cold in their studies, or someone who's never known a personal relationship with Christ as a Savior. How do you receive this? Matthew 11 and 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In verse 29, and you will find rest for your souls. That's the Lord's personal invitation to you to come to him. The gospel calls to you. Amen. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, within the sacred page, I see.
shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Thou art the bread of life, O Lord, to true